Hello, and welcome to Controversies in Church History. My name is Derek Taylor, the host for this podcast. Uh, Controversies in Church History takes you through the most important but controversial events, ideas, and developments in the history of the Catholic Communion of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, welcome. Um, this is episode five of our latest series on Catholic liberalism. Episode five, Catholic Liberalism in Retreat, 1848 to 1870. Before I begin, I want to thank everybody for listening. My regular listeners, I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to remind you that I am on the web at churchcontroversies.com. We have a blog, website, uh, access to all the earlier lectures, more information about me, if you want to know. Uh, also on Facebook and Twitter and other places, uh, please go like the page on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe also to us, not only uh, podcast, which is available on most major platforms, hosted by Anchor, uh, also on YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Um, because we're there and trying to grow, grow our little operation here, uh, all across all across social media. So welcome. So yeah. So last time we talked about how the various strands of Catholic liberalism, both as a religious movement, that is a movement within the Catholic Church to, you know, try to reconcile with the modern world by embracing certain aspects of it, embracing the separation of church and state, stuff like that. And as a theological movement, so religious liberalism on the one hand, and then theological uh, on the other, uh, sort of interacted with the church, but also with political liberalism, which that tended to encompass a lot more than uh, you know, cap merely merely trying to uh, to accommodate with modernity. <clears throat> and we ended last time in 1848, and we had talked about the influence of German thinking. Um, on liberal uh, liberalism in the Catholic Church, and we talked about some other things, the situation in Italy and in the German states. And this episode, 1848 to 1870, kind of represents in some ways the ultimate defeat of a Catholic liberal movement in the Church, of a religious movement, for reasons that will become apparent. Because in 1848, if you know anything about the history of Europe, there are a massive set of revolutions across uh, the continent. And they begin, it begins in, where else? Paris, in 1848. Um, and what happens is you have a depression in the mid-1840s, 1845. It's still on in 1848. Again, this happened the last time in Paris in 1830 when you had another revolution. <clears throat> it begins with the Parisian Revolt, in which there's this alliance of journalists, students. University students are more prominent in this than they have been in the last one and workers um, who joined to sort of overthrow an oppressive government, this time the government of Louis-Philippe, who's a liberal monarch. So this is a little different. We'll get to this in a moment. But um, it spreads, and over, they overthrow the government and pronounce the republic in 1848. And uh, it spreads very quickly to most European capitals. It doesn't get to London. Uh, it doesn't get to, to Britain at this point. But... Um, places like uh, Vienna and uh, in, in Hungary and in other places, it will spread this this uh, this revolution, usually by those groups of people in mainly in, mainly in the capital cities. It doesn't necessarily hit all of the countries that it gets into, but in particular for our purposes, it gets into the Italian states, and in particularly Giuseppe Mazzini, the revolutionary who founded Young Italy, a secret society dedicated to uniting Italy into one country, uh, takes over Rome. Um, they drive uh, the Pope, uh, Pius IX, uh, in 1848, in December of that year, out of Rome. Uh, not before, by the way, assassinating uh, one of uh, the Pope's, um, uh, one of his officials who helps run the Papal States, the secular temporal power he has in, in Italy, a guy named Pellegrino Rossi, who's a layman, uh, and they assassinate him. Pope flees for his life to Gaeta. And in 1849, they pro proclaim a Roman Republic. So the forces of liberalism politically drive the Pope out of Italy, drive a lot of conservative governments out of their places in 1849. 1849. However, within the year, you begin to have these regimes strike back. 
the militaries in most of these countries remained loyal to their governments, and they begin to turn the tide, going back into these capitals and pushing out the rebellious workers and students. In some instances, you have foreign troops um, restore the government in Hungary. Russian troops help restore order there. In Rome, uh, Pius IX is restored to his throne by French troops in 1851. And so monarchy is reestablished quickly in, uh, in Prussia, in Austria, in places like this. Uh, France uh, has a plebiscite in 1851, and they wind up electing the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon, as emperor. So they become an empire in 1851. This will have consequences for the church, by the way. And um, within the first year, there had been, you know, governments had made democratic uh, and nationalist concessions to the rebels. Mostly they're withdrawn, with a, with, a few, with a few exceptions. In places, there's a constitution in Prussia, which actually guarantees some rights for the church. And a few other places, universal franchise is not withdrawn in, in France, even under the empire, they still have a parliament. Um, but you have this general reaction. It sets in the reason why this reaction works is because the middle classes and the clergy in the, most of these countries ally with the government. Why? Because this is the key turn here. Um, the workers started preaching socialism, and they were terrified of this. I'll come back to this because this is important. So by then you have the end of, uh, of those revolutions, uh, the last sort of romantic revolutions in uh, the 19th century that are sort of romantic, liberal, nationalist, they're turned back. But the movement for national unification, both in Germany but also in Italy, is set in motion. And in 1849, you have the beginnings of um, a push for the unification of Italy, the journal Risorgimento is started in 1849, I believe, by uh, Count Cavour, who's the leader. He's the prime minister of the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia, which is the largest, most powerful country in Spain at that point. In, excuse me, in Spain, in Italy, uh, and becomes the driving force behind unification. Um, they push for, in Piedmont, Sardinia, liberal um, policies. Things like nationalization of church property, the dissolution of uh, religious orders. Why? So you can take their land and property and nationalize it. Stuff like this. Stuff that upsets Pius IX a lot. Pius IX becomes a big reactionary after the Revolution of 1848. He had been known as a sort of at least someone sympathetic to the nationalist cause and to liberalism. He never really was. He was just kind of being trying to be trying to be trying to reach out. But after the assassination of Rossi and having to flee for his life, that tended to turn him against liberalism in a political sense and in a religious sense, as we'll see. Um, but yeah, the Piedmont, uh, Piedmont uh, government basically sets its sights on getting rid of papal power uh, in Italy. And um, by the late 1850s, they make an alliance with the French. Um, uh, Napoleon III makes a secret alliance with them. He provokes a war with Austria, which is at this point the protector, along with the Fr French to a certain degree, of the Papal States. And what happens is the French defeat the Austrians. The Piedmontese uh, take over most of the Papal States in 1860. Um, the only thing in the northern part of Italy left standing is Venice, which is part of uh, Austrian territory. But in the south, the Kingdom of Naples is overwhelmed in 1861 under the combined force of the Piedmont Sardinians, but also the forces of Garibaldi, his red coats, his communist troops basically in Italy, combine to defeat uh, Naples and proclaim the kingdom of Italy. They make Victor Emmanuel I, the king of, of United Italy, whose capital is supposed to be at Rome, even though they haven't conquered it yet. All that's left basically now in Italy outside of it is the papal... is the Papal States, which is Rome and the immediate environs around it, and Venice. So the Pope is surrounded by hostile, by hostile liberal power. And from this point on, and as you can see, liberalism in both a pol uh, political sense is on the march. It's also on the march in social terms as well. And liberalism, political liberalism, liberalism ugh, I've talked about a couple of episodes here, is about the middle classes. 
And that's what kind of saved the church after the revolutions in 1848. In France, for example, the middle classes embraced the church out of fear of socialism, and the Catholics embraced Napoleon III out of fear of, well, getting trampled by liberals. Uh, and it did give, his regime did give the church some, it retained some of its privileges. Um, however, uh, this will set up an anti-clerical reaction later on in the late 1860s and 70s. And so even though it um, it gets out okay in the deals, it has some freedom of movement for things like education, which we'll come back to in a second, under Napoleon III, in the long run it's detrimental to its place. Because you're going to have, by the middle of the 18th, 19th century, you've had several generations of people who have grown up effectively outside the church, uh, who've been educated especially outside the church. And they're the people who hate the church the most. <laughs> uh, they're the most extreme liberals, the most extreme people mostly. And they're going to have a big effect as the century goes on. You also have um, uh, uh, um, liberalism um, uh, still being alive and kicking to a certain degree in the German states. In particular, it's going to be powerful in the German states in the academic realm, uh, especially under the leadership of a group of scholars from the University of Munich, uh, led by Johannes um, <clears throat> Johann Ignaz, Johann Josef Ignaz von Dollinger, we'll call him Dollinger for short, is a German historian uh, who takes the lead in trying to push the bishops of, of uh, the German Confederation and the rest of the priests toward a more nationalist sort of church structure. The idea is to have a national church so it can sort of deal with um, the nation state, the growing modern nation state in the 19th century. Um. He also pushes things like, you know, um, using German in the liturgy, um, pastoral liturgy, stuff like this, does Bondolager and gets some of the bishops on his side as things go forward in the 1850s. A Catholic party is started in Prussia, which will die out in the 1860s but be revived in the 1870s. So you do have Catholics engaging in that sense in places like the German Confederation, places like... Um, uh, France, it has a little more room to maneuver in places like Prussia because they, they did retain something of a liberal constitution there. Um, Austria, on the other hand, um, goes full reactionary in response to the 1848 uh, revolutions, signs a concordat with the church, which basically uh, you know, restores it to its place, kind of a throne and altar arrangement. It gives it lots of privileges, but Pressure from, you know, there are, there are large minorities of Protestants, you know, Jews, liberals in uh, the um, in Austria. By the late 1860s, you have a push toward, uh, and they do, they amend the Constitution to give more freedoms to them. So it leads to a reaction there as well. And in a couple of areas, the church across Europe in all countries, the Belgium, France, um, um Austria, the Italian states, uh, but also Spain. I forgot to mention the Iberian uh, countries in this lecture, but they have the same, their same conflicts are going on. There are two areas which the church is desperate to try to retain influence over society and fights for its, its legal privileges. And I want to explain this because from our perspective, this seems kind of pointless, right? We see, we think it's inevitable that it had to give up these things. The two areas are the areas of marriage and education. The church fought like cats and dogs everywhere to try to retain its rights, its exclusive right to conduct marriages. Now, why would it do that? Why would you have it conduct marriages? Well, if you're in a country of mostly Catholic people, you want to keep that so that anyone who wants to get married has to do it in the Catholic church. Um, it, it is in some regards a part matter of maintaining the faith, because if people, you know, they get married in the church, they have to be baptized there, they have to have their children raised that way, um, then you can retain their loyalties. Because they know, of course, in perfect, in mostly Catholic countries like, we're still mostly Catholic countries like France and Austria, there are people gradually emancipating themselves from them, and they're worried that's going to continue. That's why they're so, that's why the, the church, and that's why so many encyclicals are devoted to things like marriages, mixed marriages, which I talked a little bit about last time, but also things like education. The, education is the big one, right? The church, church leaders understood very well that, well, what we know today, right? 
kids, people tend to believe what they're conditioned to believe as children uh, from their peers, from their home life, from what they get in formal education. And they were really worried um, that national education systems would become anti-clerical. And for good reason. A lot of the people behind them were anti-clerical and wanted to get rid of the church's influence altogether. And in fact, this was something they they tried to fight. You can. This is one of the things I'll come back to a little bit later on this this one this episode. But you can question how wise this was because, quite frankly, there really wasn't much going to stop most of these liberal governments from taking over the educational systems in these countries, which they, which they do after 1870 mostly. But even before this, in the 1850s and 60s, they're beginning to push the church out of education. They want secular education. They want what looks like, in their mind, neutral education systems that don't teach Catholicism. And I have to say, again, you go back to this, you, have, you, just, you need to, um, we need to think about this really clearly. Again, what you're having is the emancipated, you know, middle classes wanting to sort of recreate the social order in their own image, to create a body of people, a nation state, a nation that can, you know, do things like read and write, um, you know, even in France, as late as the 17, 1870s, 1880s, they mostly, people in rural areas, can't really read and write all that well. And again, in most of those areas, the church was in charge of education. But quite frankly, you know, modern nation states, modern nations are so big, they require such resources. The church didn't have the financial resources to educate people, everyone equally in a sort of, you know, in the way we expect today. That is the achievement of modern um, education systems. However, the church wasn't wrong to be worried because along with these modern education systems become modern pedagogies, modern ideologies that go along with them. And they're quite probably right to be worried about what's going to happen later on because, of course, you can see this in the long run, people begin more and more to abandon the church. <laughs> so this is why they, they fight these liberal governments, even though they seem, they're, they're fighting what seem like to us, you know... Um, fairly standard ideas that we embrace today. Um, and so you have all this going on. And all this, by the way, I need to mention this. These liberal reforms that are going on, they're backed up by force. Uh, the nation state is a new formation in the 19th. Why is it new? By the me, I need to stress this. Nation states are different formations, say, from absolute, uh, absolute monarchies, right? Absolute monarchies don't tax their entire populations. They can't. Why? Because the nobility and the church have exemptions from it. Modern nation state taxes the entire population under their control. Why? Because they represent the entire nation. It's a nation state. Why is that important? Because they can draw on resources that no other formation in human history has been able to draw on. That's why they can fight so many awful wars. That's why they can do so many things, provide so many services. But it means they dwarf the power of the church. And it had not been that way, by the way. Even up through, even as you, it's becoming that way in the early modern period, but even up through like the 16th century, um, you know, in the Middle Ages, it's been the opposite. The church had had more wealth than these kingdoms. But now it's really at the mercy of, you know, sh you know structures that have, you know, more money and um, more guns. <laughs> And so the 1860s sees the culmination of a lot of this, you know, nationalist, and it's a liberal nationalism, by the way. Again, today, that's a totally the different, right? Liberals are all internationalists. Back then, they were nationalists. And they have no room for an international church in a lot of their, their thinking, even in Catholic countries. Uh, and so the Resorgimento advances in 1866. Um, the um, Kingdom of Italy annexes Venice. That same year, and the reason why they do this is because Austria is defeated in the Austro-Prussian Austro, Austro, uh, War. Prussia, within a few weeks, defeats the Austrians, kicks them out of the German Confederation, and so now it dominates. Prussia is the force behind unification in Germany. And then in 1870, Prussia uh, provokes a war with France, with Imperial France. Same thing, within a few weeks, they capture... Louis Napoleon at the Battle of Sedan, they proclaim a German Empire in 1871 from the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. And so by the end of the 1870s, you had the creation of two different nation states, Italy 
and Germany. Which, once the uh, the French are the last thing, the French army is all, pretty much all that's standing in between um, Rome and um, the Kingdom of Italy. Once the French are knocked out of the war in 1870, the Italian gov- uh, army marches on Rome. And in 1870, uh, Rome surrenders. They, the the uh, Italians try to cut a deal with the Pope. They offered him immunity. They 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 don't they don't attack the Vatican or the administrative buildings around it, and um, he refuses steadfastly refuses as Pius the Ninth to recognize the legitimacy of the uh, of the Kingdom of Italy. And in fact, he actually bans Catholics from participating in public life in under under pain of excommunication. Uh, so it, it's a it's a sort of bitter split on a lot of fronts. Uh, um, this march of the nation state, and uh, again, in retrospect, all this looks pointless to us because we know this is coming. We know this is going to happen, <clears throat> and you, people like to make the argument that look, the, the church is better off without the pope having the burden of this temporal authority. It's anachronistic. It's medieval. Maybe the case, but it's not a good thing. But you know, the fact that you know it was taken by force. I mean, think about it for a second. <clears throat> The conquest of the Papal States is not unlike, say, modern American attempts at nation-building. See, you had this backward state, this medieval state, this failed state, and we're going to go conquer it and turn it into democracy. The main difference is the Italians were a lot more successful. But, still, you get the idea. That's what, that's what this is. This is like warfare. It's like, you know, establishment of a, a state by right of conquest. Very interesting. Anyway, that's you know it's modernity in arms. It's liberalism in arms. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people in the Vatican couldn't forgive or forget this. So that's the political side. What's happening in the church? What's happening to the religious movement that is Catholic liberalism? Well, what happens is basically uh, is that it um, it runs into it meets its match. Uh, it uh, uh, what happens is all that political strife, all the um, fallout of the so-called Roman question after the conquest, after the creation of the state of Italy in 1861, the Roman question is obviously, what do we do about Rome? Uh, all of this turns the church in a very different direction. Now, I talked about in the previous episodes from the early 1800s, there had been an ultramontane movement in the church, right, to look to the papacy to exalt its authority in sort of <clears throat> excessive terms. Well, what happens is, and this is happening anyway, because over the decades from you know Gregory the Sixteenth to Pius through Pius the Ninth reign, what's happening is that the, the nature of the church is changing. Um, it's becoming much more centralized on Rome. Why? Because the church in these countries now is pretty much at the mercy of these increasingly liberal and as you're going to see, increasingly anti-clerical governments. And so they're looking to, people are beginning to rally around the Pope as someone who can at least try to negotiate with these governments. And so more and more, the papacy is becoming centralized. What I mean by that is it's beginning to take, uh, uh, beginning to, you know, um, it's beginning to intervene in the internal affairs of the churches in these countries, in the internal affairs of the bishops, who, again, popes had always, you know, done that from time to time, but not systematically. They're beginning to do that now under Pius IX. Other words, the power balance from between the bishops and the pope is going way in the favor of the pope. And it's supported in this, by the way, by public opinion, by Catholic opinion, for a couple of reasons. One is, well, three reasons, I would say. One is partly the personality of Pius IX himself. He's not a learned man, but he's he's charming. He has a pretty good sense of humor. He's kind of witty. He's a sympathetic guy. Um, even someone who is implacably opposed to <laughs> modernity and to liberalism, political and otherwise, as he is, he, he's a pretty charming guy. That's one reason. A second reason, of course, is just the fact that people are, because, you know, the papal states are being swallowed up and he's being threatened militarily by these countries kind of makes him into a sympathetic figure to a lot of people. Ultramontanism, and this is my point here, 
had begun life as a very popular movement in several different countries. What happens about the 1850s is that Rome systematically begins to sort of take control of that movement. And this is the third element, and I can't stress this enough. One of the reasons why it triumphs, by the way, and this is a change because uh, it triumphs over Catholic liberalism. Catholic, remember, Catholic liberals like Lamennais had been ultramontanists. They had wanted to interpose the power of the papacy against a modern state. Uh, what happens is that these ultramontanists, well, well, two things happen. One is they gain the ear of the Pope, and so he begins pushing in that direction. And all this activity, this political activity, leads to polarization on both sides of the, not just within the church, but I'm talking about with secular liberals, political liberals in Europe, and the church. They become both, both sides much more intransigent. This is aided by the Catholic press. Because you remember, if you go back to the Restoration period in France, for example, the press was something sort of evil in the eyes of most, like, you know, traditional Catholics, intransigent, ultra-Catholics. What happens is in the 1840s, they begin do, uh, 1830s and 40s, um, those ultra-Catholics begin getting into the press and using the press to propagate ultramontanism. Two people, two organs, I guess, are the most responsible for this. One is the uh, French, he's a convert, actually, I think he was an agnostic before he became Catholic, uh, a French uh, newspaper man named Louis Vuillot. Vuillot is the most ultramontane of ultramontanes. Ult um, ultramontanes. Uh, I'll get to this in a second. He exalts the papacy's power in almost ridiculous terms. But also in the, uh, 1849 was founded um, Civilta, Civilta Catolica. That is the Jesuit newspaper in Rome, which becomes a sort of de facto newspaper. There's actually an actual newspaper, uh, La Salvatore Romano, but Civilta Catolica is kind of the, becomes kind of the mouthpiece of the papacy. Run by Jesuits, who, again, it's hard to imagine now, at that point were the most reactionary people in the church. <laughs> And so what happens is you begin to have this exaltation of papal authority. And let me be clear about something. Pope's authority has always been regarded in, high, uh, in very excessive terms. You've always had exaggerations of papal authority in the Middle Ages. You know, theologians here and there in, in controversies would exalt his power to the nth degree. There's always some brainless curial sycophant who's making silly statements about the Pope's power. But what's different here is it's amplified by the press for the first time, by a popular press. Louis Villot, I'm about to criticize him a lot. He did do some good things for the church. Um, uh, he did in trying to you know, resist the encroachment of governments and things like this. But he attacked any Catholic who disagreed with him in the slightest, anybody who didn't was a traitor to the cause, and he and others, uh, you know, Cavilta Catholica, used the most insane rhetoric to describe the Pope. Here I'm going to quote to you. Uh, this is from by uh, this is a French historian, Roger uh, Roger Aubert, talking about the what can only be called papal papal idolatry of these thinkers. And I have to stress this. This is this is the rhetoric they use. This is let me read this quote here. Quote. The Pope was referred to as the, quote, vice god of mankind, unquote, and the, quote, permanent word incarnate, unquote. Monsignor Mirmio preached on the, quote, three incarnations of the Son of God, unquote, in the womb of the Virgin Mary in the Eucharist and in, quote, the old man in the Vatican, unquote. Uh, Cavilta Catholica went so far as to write that, quote, when the Pope meditates, it is God who is thinking through him. Unquote. Let me be clear about that, by the way, about all those statements. They are no question heresy. That is nuts. <laughs> that is completely nuts. And by the way, they knew this was they knew this was exaggeration and flattery. And by the way, Pius the Ninth, who is a I, 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 I revere Pio no, no, I think he's a good pope, he never objected to this. And if you're wondering where you get the like these dumb ideas you hear your fellow Catholics sometimes spout to you, like for example, after you know Pope Francis has said something silly on an airplane, that oh, like you know everything he says must be you know doctrine or something. 
uh, or you know, somebody. I've had so many people tell me, "Well, the Pope, the Pope can't err because you know he can't commit heresy." Because why? Because the Holy Spirit's supposed to choose the Pope in the conclave. These types of exaggerations, again, they have roots in the Middle Ages and the early modern period and the post-Trent period, but they don't get spread abroad widely to a wide audience until this period. And it's people like Vuyo and the Kivilta Catholico who are responsible for this. I say all this because you can imagine what both secular but also Catholic liberals thought of this. And the answer is they freaking hated it. <laughs> it led to serious tensions in France, for example. Um, here you are, you have these liberals who, you know, in a religious sense, are trying to do what they can to adapt themselves to the modern world. And still say faithful to the church, and here you have people like Vio treating the Pope like he is Jesus himself. Uh, and there are still followers of La Monet, for example, around in France. Uh, they, in 1855, for example, Montalem uh, Charles Montalembert and his friends restart the correspondent, the correspondent, the old newspaper started by La Monet. And more to the point, Catholic liberals in France still have some clout. There are a few bishops who are on their side. At the Sorbonne, uh, led by Monsignor Marais, um, you have even more consistent. Those liberals uh, under Montalembert and uh, the um, uh, uh, Dupin Lou, the Bishop of Orléans, they're 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 Catholic liberals in a moderate sense. They're, they want to make deals basically with the modern state to have some freedoms and not get crushed. It's less a matter of principle. There are, though, principal Catholic liberals in the Sorbonne, like Meret and, and other theologians who want to reconcile, in a principled sense, the ideals of 1789 with the Church. They're fewer in number. Most people are just looking to make a better deal with the modern state. You have Catholic liberalism uh, in England. Um, there's a, a, a newspaper called The Rambler, a Catholic newspaper, under uh, a guy named John Acton. Must be Lord Acton. He's an historian. He advocates liberalism in both political and religious and academic terms. Um, and elsewhere. There are liberals, Catholic liberals like that, religious liberals everywhere, who are basically Orthodox, but want to, you know, they want to make some concessions to the modern world all across Europe. The problem is, of course, as you've just seen after 1860, <laughs> you know, first of all, you have liberal states gobbling up the papal states. Secondly, wherever liberals come to power, political ones, um, they tend to enact anti-clerical legislation. They tend to immediately start dissolving monasteries and religious orders, nationalizing church property, and getting the church out of education. Uh, and that's partly that push-pull is what makes, uh, basically my point, leads ultramontanism to overwhelm a lot of these um, these liberal uh, these liberals in these countries, um, and so it swamps this movement under in a lot of ways. And all of this, by the way, leads up to um, the syllabus of errors in 1864. Uh, the Pope had been trying to, you know, thinking about for several years to try to encapsulate all the things that were wrong with the modern world, and instead of um, Instead of, um, excuse me, um, instead of doing something about this in which he, you know, tried to sort of make clear, you know, you know, okay, when is liberalism okay, when is it not? He'd made a lot of concessions, actually, Pius IX, in the years leading up to the 1860s. And so he felt the need to re-emphasize, in principle, what was wrong with liberalism. So he issued an encyclical called Quanta Cura uh, in 1864, which was amended along with a syllabus of errors in which he condemns all, actually all the areas of modernity. Actually, these are all excerpts of stuff he's previously, previously condemned. It's basically a compendium of 80 condemnations drawn from both his, but also, uh, yeah, pretty much off of his, you know, in the last 20 years or so of his pontificate, condemnations of things like, you know, rationalism, pantheism, uh, naturalism, um, Indifferentism. Indifferentism is the idea that all religions are the same. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Uh, condemnation of communism, socialism, secret societies, condemnation of, you know, all different sorts of things. And, uh, <clears throat> and the thing about this is that for the most part, again, 
for the most part, this stuff is kind of, you take it out of context, it's pretty much straightforward. There are certain things that the church, you know, lines can't cross. I say this because it, it mixes up a lot of things that are, that are doctrinal with things that are not necessarily inalterable. And this is where it gets the church into trouble because a lot of people take this as a condemnation of basically any sort of compromise with modern governments, the modern state. And indeed, by the way, again, Pius IX has a lot of advisors who are really extreme. Uh, the syllabus of errors, among other things, is a big middle finger <laughs> to all these states that are kind of gobbling up the papal states. And it's what the, it's, it's really meant to be provoke, provocative, and it is uh, in a lot of ways. Um, Protestants in England and in the Netherlands and across the continent hate it, react against it. Uh, political liberals in every state are affronted by it. Catholic liberals in France are shaken. Uh, well, actually, I believe it's Dupanloup, uh, the Bishop of Orléans, who's a Catholic liberal, who, do, who asks for a clarification and then writes a commentary on it, which kind of reconciles the Catholic liberals, uh, reconciles his pie of the knife with the Catholic liberals there later on. Um, and it actually saves Catholic liberals from being condemned there. Um the point is, it was done to try to clarify things. It didn't really do that. It's too broad in the brush it paints. And it really made things worse. It escalated. It added to the rise of uh, anti-clericalism. And again, it's this sort of spiral of, you know, um, intransigence that goes forth and leads to, you know... Um, this really combative stance, and as we'll get to this in the next uh, the next episode, but it'll lead to conflicts, even worse conflicts with um, the uh, new state of Germany. And at the same time, it also exacerbates um, tensions within the church uh, in terms of theological liberalism, and theological liberalism is most prevalent in Germany, um, outside of France, and in particular, it'll really. It really upsets people like von Dollinger, who is the leader of the Munich School there. And I have to stand back for a second and, and discuss this. One of the things that Dollinger and his companions wanted to do um, in the academic setting they were in, remember they're in state universities in, uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, in which they, they, they frequently... You know, they're, they're, they're engaged in scholarly debates with Protestants and non-Catholics. And quite frankly, the level of scholarship, especially historical scholarship, is a lot higher in Protestant and non-Catholic circles. Catholics have an inferiority complex because, quite frankly, they're not as educated as Protestants and non-Catholics. Uh, Dollinger is one of the best historians of his age, um, dis uh, irregardless of, of affiliation. And, and yet, the publication of the syllabus all these condemnations coming from Rome seem to him like obscurantism, like the church is turning its back on learning itself. Um, and um, he's worried, you know, that it's going to make the church look ridiculous in the eyes of the educated classes of Europe. And um, so he begins pushing for, in 1863, openly, um, he ha gathers a bunch of theologians in Munich at a conference, where he gives a speech in which uh, he demands full academic freedom. And I had to explain this. You know, history, for example. History was just becoming, in that era, had just become a profession, uh, an academic one. Again, history had not really been a profession before. It's just something people did in their spare time. And the, the history, history, as practiced by academics to this day, is much more rigorous much more strict in its methods of interpretation and analysis, you know, using linguistic tools, um, than your than you know history had been before. And again, most Catholic theologians were not comfortable with it because they didn't they'd never been trained in it. And that, and because of course, free thinkers and Protestants wielded it against the church's teachings. There's a lot of pushback against this in Germany and elsewhere. Uh, and von Dollinger. Uh, you know, rightly thought that hey, we need to at least at least embrace the best of this to prove that we're not we're not just we're not just people who are ignorant and cling to our dumb beliefs, right? Um, and um, 
And so his speech in 1863 um, really upset a lot of people because it basically just, it, um, you know, he came to, and I'm not going to go with this in too much detail, Von Dolger began to sort of trash other, other Catholic theologians for not being, you know, historical enough, and not being, <clears throat> not being, um, um, you know, not being, well, smart enough. And give you give an example. Um, he says things. This is one of his, from his speech in 1863. He says, "Quote: Mistakes and errors of a scientific nature can only be, be evaluated by scientific means. For whoever does otherwise damages both theology and the church, which can no longer no, no longer exist without a progressive theology." Unquote. And you shouldn't take that word "progressive" in a political sense at that point. But he's saying, at the very least, you have to, be able to explain these things in those terms to these people. They're never going to buy the church's faith anymore. And um, the reaction against him especially comes from a quarter of the church which is just being revived in the 1860s, which is scholastic theology. Remember, I mentioned this last, I think in the last lecture, that scholastic theology in the church was in a bad state in the first half of the century. In the 1850s, there is a revival of Thomistic theology and philosophy in schools in Rome and elsewhere. Um, uh, and it doesn't really, but it doesn't really get going, this revival of Thomism and scholasticism until after 1870. And in the 1860s, it's still it's still deficient in a lot of ways, academically speaking. And a lot of these neo-scholastic thinkers um, didn't like the new theology, the his, more historical based, historically based theology of people like uh, uh, Dollinger, and um, they were less important. They were less concerned with raising the intellectual level of priests at that point in seminaries than they were of, of raising their moral level, which is understandable. But to someone like Dollinger, this looked like the church was just abandoning, you know, reason itself practically. Uh, in fact, the sort of historical methods that they used in the modern, you know, historical setting there in these universities, uh, they were not necessarily innocent. Um, they came with, I mean, they were invented by Protestants and non-Catholics, uh, and so they were being used against the faith. That's what made these these sort of reactionary scholastics um, uh, so suspicious of Dullinger. And it, so again, leads to a sort of spiral of distrust and conflict to the point where, you know, you know, Von Dolger gives that speech in 1863, all of a sudden uh, the hierarchy turns on him. And so he begins sort of pushing back. Again, continuing his demand for complete academic freedom from the magisterium. Saying, we can't do theology if you're, you're having the, the magisterium look over our shoulder. And, um, and to be fair, and uh, again, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I've read that some of these scholastic theologians in Germany, for example, uh, they didn't necessarily fight fair uh, in these arguments. These were polemics anyway. They weren't even really much arguments. Lots of screaming and yelling in print. But some of them used, you know, their connections to the hierarchy to get, you know, opponents condemned. Uh, and so you have this bad, bitter, bitter conflicts engaging out of this. And I, I have to stop here for a second because this is really important because... Um, the sort of theology that's associated with these German professors, and it's a minority, but Dollinger and his other um, colleagues who are with him, well, two things. One, they get themselves into trouble because they start basically trashing everything that comes out of Rome in the mid-1860s in ways that are it get them in trouble. That's their fault. Um, they, they took the bait from these ultramontanists. And, yeah, I mean, bashing bishops, bashing the pope, as you're going to see, it gets Dollinger excommunicated in the end. Um, the other thing, though, is they were really good at their jobs. They really were good historians. And yet their writings were kind of tainted with this idea, I think I mentioned it last time, of historicism. The idea that you can only understand church doctrine in historical terms. That, you know, it's almost like a historical relativism where, you know, doctrine has to change with the times or something. And that's the sort of legacy in some way that's going to feed into later on, we'll get to this in this last episode coming up, it's going to feed later on into modernism as an intellectual movement because there's so much emphasis on history, it almost tends to undermine the unchanging character of, of uh, church teaching. <laughs>
Nevertheless, Dolinger, you know, was you know had a, a reasonable concern. You're making the church look foolish in the eyes of educated people who otherwise want to get rid of it. In any case, in any case, all this comes to a head in 1869. Why? Because since 1864, Pius IX had been thinking about calling for an ecumenical council of the bishops. By 1867, it was being reported in the press, the Catholic press, that a council would take place and that it would declare the Pope's infallibility. Uh, and the Vatican set about creating a plan for discussion, which was very tightly controlled by Pius and his advisors, who were mostly of these, these neo-scholastic types who were opposed to Dullinger and the sort of new historical theology. And there was a lot of tension over this, because again, you have this, this doctrine which had been believed for centuries and argued for by, by church, you know, by saints like Robert Bellarmine. But there were some people who, even though they agree with it, thought it was a, wasn't a great time to be doing this. <laughs> Among them, John Henry Newman, who thought the moment was quote-unquote inopportune because of, well, the fact that you had liberal governments breathing down the necks of Catholics. Uh, for in Newman's mind, there was no emergency. He didn't need to call. He didn't need to do this. Um, others thought that the doctrine of papal infallibility didn't need to be defined properly to be effective. And then you had other people like Bob Dollinger, Lord Acton, who thought the doctrine simply couldn't hold up to historical scrutiny. And in fact, what happens is even before the council gets started, uh, Dollinger starts publishing pamphlets criticizing the doctrine of uh, papal infallibility. He writes a few books, um, you know, mocking the idea of it. He brings up um, embarrassing historical episodes in which popes obviously erred. And by the way, there have been times in the history of the church, I, 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 I've, done, I've done a talk on Vatican I and infallibility. There have been times, yes, when popes have, when using their public authority, they have erred, theologically speaking. Not many, but it's happened. Um, long story short, this is essentially, and they're not wrong, by the way, to be afraid of this, because Von Dollinger, even though he's one of the best historians in the Catholic world, is not asked to help prepare um, the documents of the council. And in fact, it's essentially an anti-liberal council. It's really being, in some ways, it's meant to proclaim the church's authority in the person of the pope with infallibility. Uh, it's his primacy. Um, but it also condemns certain doctrines that are associated with them. It condemns the uh, the the teachings of Anton Gunther. It's actually in the the um, the documents of Vatican I. I won't belabor this because I've done it before. Um, but it is essentially a response to you know the modern nation state, which is taking over the world. Um, basically, claiming that yeah, you may have taken away the papal states, but I'm still the teacher of mankind, as it were. Um, hence, you know, the doctrine of infallibility. It also defines the, uh, the, the Pope as the sort of universal head of the church in very all-encompassing terms of jurisdiction. Again, this is a response partly to the claims, because again, in a way, the modern state can't be neutral. It is making claims. I mean, you say it's neutral, then if it's neutral toward religion, then why does it get to sort of dissolve religious orders? <laughs> if it's neutral, why does it get to go gobble up the papal state? Um, so it responds in kind by defining its own authority in very high terms in principle anyway. And, um, yeah, long story short, this this is in some ways um, marks the end of the, uh, of the liberal movement because it basically condemns any sort of compromise in, um, I say, I say com compromise, it sort of cuts off uh, uh, any thought about compromising with the modern world. And I say this, by the way, I'm not, I'm not going to belabor it. The, the, some of the constitutions of, of Vatican I are very interesting. They're not as extreme as you think they are, um, especially the, do the doctrine of infallibility. It's actually very narrowly drawn. Remember, the idea of infallibility is only ex cathedra statements when the Pope intentionally uh, invokes the full, the very full authority of his office and speaking to the entire church on faith and morals. Um, and quite frankly, one of the reasons it's so narrow, first of all, one of the reasons it's so narrow is 
there's no way you could claim anything else. Um, but one of the reasons it's so narrow is probably because of, despite the fact they went too far and were really vicious and hateful in their criticism of the Pope, people like Von Dollinger were right. And that got through to the, the, uh, the people at the council. Because there are people, by the way, around the Pope who wanted to turn him into God's oracle on Earth. Um, there's no way that could be true. Um, Dollinger was right about that. And it was divisive uh, infallibility. Um, the first constitution of the church, Dei Filius, was passed unanimously by the bishops. The constitution on infallibility, Pastor Eternus, uh, of the 744 present, 200 abstained. Only two openly opposed it. And so, again, many who were against it just left Rome before the final vote because they knew they were going to lose. So, <clears throat> this leads to, and this is the last thing I'm going to wrap up here. This has already gone on too long as it is. What happens is <clears throat> the church basically, um, you know, stands its ground and turns against the modern world. And at least that's how people interpreted it. <clears throat> um, uh, what happens in the wake of this, again, uh, you know, um, they proclaim the doctrine of infallibility on uh, July of 18th. You know, um, and it's it, by September. I think I said uh, mistaken earlier. I said it was July, but it's in uh, September that Rome is taken by Italian forces. And in fact, the council ha wasn't over by then. He had to adjourn it because the <laughs> Italians disrupted it. Um, but this also, of course, was taken by liberals as an act of war, political liberals across Europe. The chancellor of the new German Empire, uh, von Bismarck, sent a dispatch around to his counselors that said, quote, he's talking about the, the papacy, they have become vis-a-vis -vis the governments the official of a foreign sovereign and indeed of a sovereign who, by virtue of his infallibility, is a perfectly absolute sovereign, more absolute than any monarch of the world, unquote. So it makes people angry in the political world. Um, it's seen as ridiculous by, by liberals in England, for example. Um, it's even, and it is condemned. Um, by 44 German professors, Catholic professors from Munich, led by Dollinger. Um, in response, um, the Archbishop of Munich calls on Dollinger to, to submit. Uh, he, um, um, he refuses to submit. He says, I can't accept this doctrine as a theologian, as an historian, as a citizen. And the Archbishop, in response, excommunicates uh, von Dollinger. A number of other Catholics, as well as dissident clergy and bishops, refuse to accept the decrees, and they break away, and they, they join the old Catholic Church, which is a, a schismatic church which still exists to this day. Uh, even though von Dollinger never joins them himself, he dies excommunicated, never recants. And so, again, the, the, by the end of this period, it looks like, in theological terms and in, uh, in terms of a religious movement of wanting to you know, wanting to make some compromise of the modern world, it looks like the that Catholic liberalism is finished. But was it? Um, and this is where I'll leave off. Um, uh, it's not actually quite finished. There are still some bishops in France who are uh, warming up to it. There's the you know people in the Sorbonne in Paris who have some ideas there. It still exists. And as we're going to see in the next episode, I think it might be the second to last episode, I think we'll have one short one at the end to discuss, to assess the legacy of, of Catholic liberalism. There's still followers of Lamennais in the seminaries of France. There are still admirers elsewhere, as we're going to see. You're going to see, I haven't mentioned the Americas at all. You get one last big movement, one last condemnation at the end of the 19th century of a form of liberalism. Uh, so it's sort of like uh, Wesley in The uh, Princess Bride, right? Uh, it's not uh, all dead. It's only mostly dead is Catholic liberalism as a religious movement. However, it very much remains alive as an ideal. And those two things will occupy us in the, the, the next episode. We'll talk about Catholic liberalism from 1870 up to 1900 or so. Um on the one hand, its last expressions as an organized movement within the church, trying to make adaptations to the modern world, but also, more importantly, its intellectual influence. Because this is where, and you know where I'm going with this, 
theological liberalism, which been condemned several times by several popes at this point, does continue on and will feed into the intellectual um, apparatus of the modernist movement. So that's for next time. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Again, um, really appreciate you guys. Oh, sorry this was a little bit of a longer episode. Hopefully next one will be pretty short. Uh, again, remember to like and subscribe. Um, do me a favor, all of you, if you could, if you really like this, you thought it was good, informative, you know, tell one friend about this, about controversies in church history, let them know uh, so we can get some more subscribers and spread the word about what we're doing. Uh, and so that's it for this episode. Uh, Next time, we'll, we'll uh, hopefully finish up with the history of Catholic liberalism in the 19th century. God bless you all. Thank you, guys. Take care. Uh, have a good one.